Let us begin the day with prayer. New every morning is your love, great God of light. And all day long you are working for good in the world. Stir up in us desire to serve you, to live peacefully with our neighbors, and to devote each day to your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ the Lord. Amen. We're going to spend some time this morning giving you the chance with the teams that you brought from your annual conference to talk about the work of your board, the ministry that you are engaged in, and the process that you use when you work with candidates and clergy for ordained ministry. So I'm going to present some issues, give you the chance for some team discussion, and come back and present you with more questions and challenges for you to talk about among your team, and that's how the morning will go. So as we begin, think back. Think back to what it was like for you when you began the process for a licensed or ordained ministry. How did those first interviews go? When you met with your church's pastor parish relations committee, when you met with the district committee on ordained ministry for the first time, or when you met with the board itself? Do you remember when you first said yes to God's call for your life? And the way you felt when you met with all those committees to talk about how you were answering that call? Was the candidacy and ordination process an easy one for you? Were you delayed along the way, or did you move through without much trouble? Who were your mentors? Whether they were assigned through your district committee or board, or whether you had built informal mentoring relationships with other clergy. What did you learn from your mentors, and how has that stayed with you throughout your ministry? Finally, what excited you the most about following a call? What made you say yes then? And maybe more importantly, what makes you continue to say yes today? We're here for the next two and a half days to talk about candidates, clergy, and the way your board works with them. Your board has the responsibility to assess candidates and evaluate their giftedness or their potential for licensed and ordained ministry their readiness to serve, and their ongoing effectiveness in ministry. During the workshops this afternoon and tomorrow, you'll have the chance to discuss the new Book of Discipline and the legislation that came out of General Conference, along with the time to talk about details of the responsibilities that you have. But this morning, we're going to talk about generally about the process, about the overall ministry of the board, to work with candidates and clergy as they come to you to be assessed for licensed and ordained ministry. As members of the board and the district committees on ordained ministry, we work with different types of candidates along the way. People come from a variety of places in life and bring different expectations and understandings of what it means to answer God's call. While people come to the board in response to a personal call, it is the responsibility of your board to work with candidates in such a way so that together we can discern whether or not someone is called to ordained or licensed ministry in the church. A call is heard by an individual who responds to God's call in his or her life, but it is the community, your community, that confirms and affirms that person's individual call to a particular ministry and discerns with candidates to find places where their gifts enable them to best respond to God's call in their lives and to ministry on behalf of the United Methodist Church. And you know that many times we are able to affirm and rejoice in someone's call. Sometimes, however, a candidate's gifts and grace are not a good fit for the United Methodist Church or for a particular annual conference. And boards or district committees must deny a candidate's application and work with that candidate to identify other places to serve. No matter what the outcome is for a candidate, district committee and board members are called to be in a holy place with that person, a place of discernment for and with candidates, as together we seek God's voice and calling in an individual's life. 
It's not a new observation that an organization gets the types of leaders it nurtures and the types of leaders it deserves. Gil Rendell, Lovett Weems, and many others who help our denomination focus on leadership development have stated this in a number of different ways. The process we use to nurture and develop clergy leadership, the ways that district committees and boards interact with candidates, and the support we provide for ongoing formation toward effectiveness all contribute to the outcome of providing the church with the types of leaders who are credentialed and appointed to serve on our behalf. So this morning, I want to challenge you to not only think how your board implements process in the evaluation of candidates, but I also want you to take one step back and consider if the process your board implements in assessing candidates for ministry and nurturing clergy in ongoing effectiveness is getting you the results you need to have effective clergy in your annual conference and in the church. As Gwen Pershotham reminded us in the questions she challenged us with in the welcome letter you received, how does your practice of ministry as a board reflect what you believe? Where do you see incongruities? And how can you lessen the gap between your theology and your practice? And how does your practice of ministry in the board's work nurture and develop the types of leaders the church needs? You know as well as I do, there is currently a lot of emphasis on effectiveness. In general church conversations around the possible elimination of security of appointment, or when we talk about church development and finding the best way to revitalize local congregations, or in the general conference's support of the Young Clergy Initiative that will focus on increasing the number of young adult clergy, the church expects that the clergy who are appointed to serve are effective and able to provide the leadership needed for the church today and into the future. The candidates being shaped for the next generation of clergy leadership will be responsible for leading the church into a new way of doing ministry. The United States is more global today, more advanced technologically, and more diverse than ever before. However, the new leaders that we are nurturing are inheriting an aging, shrinking denomination that has not yet figured out the best way to reach young adults. And in a country that becomes more diverse every day, it is sad that many of our churches remain segregated or refuse to accept a woman or a person of color as their pastor. You may have seen the research from the Pew Forum on Religion and Public Life that was published a couple of weeks ago. And if not, the summary of findings is on the event webpage. For the first time in our history, the United States is on the verge of becoming a minority Protestant country. The number of those who say they are not affiliated with any faith has doubled, and one in four, or 25 percent, of 18 to 29-year-olds claim no religious affiliation. None. You've heard that language now, right? None. 25 percent of 18 to 29-year-olds. People do not automatically go to church anymore. And in the United States, membership continues to decline. We know the challenges. We know the need for change. The next generation of clergy and laity will lead the way for the church to change and will give guidance for us to thrive in a vastly different landscape than the one in which we all started. It's a challenging time to be a leader, but I believe this is a time that is filled with exciting possibilities. As the new quadrennium begins, our church has the chance to reset, to reprioritize, and explore new ways to meet our current challenges as we prepare for the future. Sorry about that. Technology being one of them, obviously. So we hope over the next two and a half days, you will be challenged to think about the process your board uses for evaluating candidates for giftedness and fitness for ministry, which happens at the certified candidacy level, and then for readiness for ministry at the provisional and licensing level, and for effectiveness when they apply to continue in licensed ministry or become fully ordained members of the annual conference. We will also talk about continuing formation for ordained and licensed clergy. 
But before we get to the specifics of the process you have developed in your annual conference, let's take some time to look generally at your board and some of the initial questions that you may have. I want to give you now about 15 minutes in your annual conference team to discuss these questions. What does your board do well? What gifts to, do you bring to the work of the board? What are your initial questions about the work of your board and your role as a board member and officer this quadrennium? And where do you see the potential areas of growth? I know some of you have been serving on the board. This is probably maybe your third quadrennium or maybe this is the second or maybe the third time you've served on your board. I know some of you have never been on a board of ordained ministry and this is your first quadrennium to serve in this capacity. So take some time to talk about what's new and what's challenging and some of your experience and we'll give you about 15 minutes. There are discussion questions spread around the tables and then these questions will remain on the screen as well. We're going to shift now to talking about some of the assessment levels that the board is responsible for, both the district committees and the boards. One of the most important tasks of the board is to assess candidates for licensed and ordained ministry. This happens at many different points in the process, at the certified candidacy level, at the license for pastoral ministry, at application for commissioning and provisional membership, and application for ordination and full membership. As candidates move through different points in the candidacy and ordination process and the licensing process, we expect them to be able to talk about their call to license or ordain ministry, to demonstrate their readiness to serve in an appointment setting, and to eventually be able to demonstrate their effectiveness. So one way to look at these different expectations is to think about the different ways that candidates respond to a call to ministry and how they develop their gifts. One of my favorite movies. Have you seen the movie Up? Okay, it's a great movie. Up tells the story of Russell and Carl. Russell is a young wilderness explorer scout who is working on his final merit badge, which is called Assisting the Elderly. Carl Fredrickson is a 78-year-old man who has recently lost his wife and is now trying to fulfill their lifelong dream of visiting Paradise Falls, Venezuela. So one day, Russell knocks on Mr. Fredrickson's door in an effort to fulfill his goal of completing all of his merit badges. Russell then becomes an accidental passenger on Mr. Fredrickson's journey to Paradise Falls. So let's watch now how they journey together through their initial introduction to beginning the journey to some of the things that they learn from each other along the way. All right, here you have it. One picture of an eager candidate. Clearly, Russell is following his call toward becoming a fully certified wilderness explorer. He's excited and he's found a mentor in Mr. Fredrickson, even though Mr. Fredrickson is a little bit reluctant to do that, right? And Russell's got some of the knowledge, but very little of the experience that he needs for this journey. Finishing the journey isn't as easy as Russell thinks it's going to be. Things are different outside in the real world. There are surprises and challenges along the way. Russell gets tired and when the time comes for him to perform, to set up his tent for the first time, it's obvious that he needs more practical experience before he will become an expert. Russell thought he was ready, and in one sense, he was. But for any vocation to move from being an eager candidate to an experienced and effective leader takes time and work by the candidate and requires support and feedback from all of those involved in the candidate's formation. So spend some time now with your annual conference talking about the process that you have developed for identifying and nurturing those candidates who demonstrate leadership potential. 
This is, these are two slides, so you'll probably have to refer more to the paper on your table, but the questions are, application for ministry is a process, so what process is established in your annual conference to enlist, assess, and evaluate candidates for ministry? How do your district committees and board prepare those who show potential but don't really fully realize the scope of skills that are required and the complexity needed to serve? How do or how can your district committees and boards foster a learning environment both for candidates and board members as you reflect on your work? What situations provide for the greatest learning potential? And what parts of your board's process could be strengthened? And then are there areas where you could strengthen mentoring, interview, or feedback structures for candidates and for board members as you all and they complete your work and their work? We'll take about 15 minutes to discuss these within your annual conference. So you've had a little bit of time now to talk about your board's process in general and to look at things from the beginning, the time when many candidates are excited by the challenge of developing a better understanding of what it takes to serve in ministry as well as the needs for ongoing learning and feedback throughout the process. So let's shift now to how you as a board can work with candidates to identify and discern their gifts for ministry. I believe one of the best things about the United Methodist Church's candidacy and provisional period is the opportunity for candidates to develop a better understanding of the gifts they have to offer to the church. Simultaneously, district committees and boards are able to get to know candidates and to affirm their gifts while helping them to hone the skills that they have to offer. When boards and district committees are intentional in working with candidates to discern gifts for ministry, the candidate and annual conference can develop long-lasting foundations for ministry and ongoing effective service. Additionally, the candidate then has the opportunity to better understand how their gifts fit in the church's ministry, in the ministry of your annual conference, and beyond your annual conference. Along the way, through mentoring, committee and board interviews, evaluation of the person's work, psychological assessments, and the many different pieces of information we receive, it is the responsibility of candidates, mentors, district committees, and boards to work together to develop a clear sense of who that candidate is, the gifts that she or he brings to licensed or ordained ministry, and the ways that people can serve in the United Methodist Church. In the 2009 movie, The Blind Side, we, we learn the story of Michael Orr, an offensive lineman for, who plays for the professional football team, the Baltimore Ravens. Michael Orr spent most of his childhood in foster care, bouncing from family to family with little structure and virtually no chance to develop long-term relationships. We meet Michael in his junior year of high school as he enters a rich prep school on scholarship. Early in the movie, we also meet Leanne Tui, who takes Michael into her home after she realizes that he will have to sleep outside on a cold, rainy night. When Leanne learns that Michael has no family to be with on Thanksgiving, she invites him to stay for the Tui's dinner. And we see their relationship develop to the point where Michael officially and legally is adopted into the Tui family. So then during his senior year, Michael is recruited to play football, mainly because of his size. Michael has never played football. He doesn't understand his role on the team. He doesn't know what a lineman is. He doesn't realize the best ways to use his size and natural athletic talent to the team's best advantage. Others see his potential as a gifted athlete but he has not developed his knowledge or the skills that he'll need in order to be successful. So in steps Leanne. Leanne knows football and the different skills that the players need in order to excel. Additionally, and this is more important, Leanne understands Michael, the gifts that he brings and the way that she can motivate Michael to do his job. So let's see what happens at his, one of his first football practices. That is a great movie. Did you catch that line, you've got to know your players, Bert? That's right. 
That's a good lesson for us. You've got to know your players. Leanne brings together two areas of knowledge that work for Michael's good and for the good of the team. She understands what the team needs for success, and she understands the best way that Michael can contribute to the team. And even more importantly, she knows how to communicate with Michael in such a way that he effectively responds to her teaching. So I'm going to invite you now to spend some more time talking about how this applies to your annual conference. In order to accurately assess how candidates will be able to serve in your context, first you have to be able to identify what is needed and how candidates can demonstrate that they meet those qualifications at different levels along the way. For example, when candidates apply for certification, we ask that they demonstrate fitness or potential or giftedness for ministry. When candidates apply for provisional membership or for licensing, we ask that they successfully show how they are ready to serve in an appointment setting. And when candidates apply for full membership and ordination, we ask to see how they have demonstrated success, how they have been effective in ministry during the provisional period. So, back to the discussion questions, what do you expect candidates to demonstrate and what do you require when candidates apply for certified candidacy, licensing, provisional membership, and ordination? And then, what criteria have you established in your annual conference to help you know candidates are ready for approval at these different levels? And how do your district committees and boards learn about and understand the gifts that each candidate brings and determine if candidates meet your established criteria? And then what process has been developed to, to provide feedback to your district committee members and to your board members regarding their ability to accurately assess and evaluate candidates? And again, we'll take about 15 minutes for conversation. Okay. If I could interrupt you for just a second. We're going to return real quickly to the blind side. We saw Leanne's role in helping both Michael and the coach realize what Michael brings to the team. And along the way, the coach and Michael's teammates have helped him develop as an offensive lineman. So during practice, Michael has had the chance to hone his new skills to practice them in a variety of settings. And now Michael is playing in a game. He's been asked to demonstrate his effectiveness as he moves to the next level of evaluation. It's game time, so let's see how he does. I guess he did his job, right? <laughs> so as you can see, sometimes it's pretty clear cut whether or not a person can be effective with a particular skill set. Yeah. At other times, however, boards must make decisions that aren't as easily discerned. We have to ask ourselves whether or not the training and the development that we employ with provisional members will provide the desired results. In other words, will the process that we implement be helpful in training provisional members to grow in effectiveness and eventually demonstrate their effectiveness and their potential for continued growth as they move into full membership? So as we think about the provisional period and the formation that takes place in your annual conference and commissioning and ordination, I want you to talk about these questions. How has, or, or whatever applies for your context, um, how has your conference defined effectiveness and how do you determine and measure a candidate's effectiveness as they apply for continued licensing and ordination? And what are the desired outcomes of your provisional member residency program? How do you determine if those outcomes have been achieved? And what methods or resources have you used in your residency program to develop provisional members' ability to articulate and reflect theologically on their ministry? What skills have you identified that are needed by those in the residency program? How have you incorporated them into your continuing education component of the residency program? And how does your program allow for participants to develop and reflect on problem-solving abilities and conflict resolution? And then, again, the evaluation of your work and feedback of your process. What methods do you use to consistently evaluate your program to receive feedback from participants, ministry settings, district superintendents, and the bishop? And again, we'll take about 15 minutes. 
All along the way, we've talked as candidates progress through um, candidacy, through the provisional period to demonstrating effectiveness, and now we're going to focus a little bit on what happens to someone after they have um, become a licensed local pastor or a full member and they, con and they continue to serve in ministry in your annual conference. Now, I do serve on my conference board of ordained ministry, and I have served on district committees on ordained ministry. And one of the most exciting things for me about serving on the board is when candidates are successful and have found a good fit for ministry in the United Methodist Church. When a local pastor is able to serve his or her church effectively, when someone presents himself or herself fulfilled, for full membership, knowing that they are giving their all to answer God's call and have successfully demonstrated their gifts, their skills, their effectiveness, it is truly a joy to be a part of that process. Yet we know when newly ordained members take that final step, there is still risk in moving from the support received during candidacy education, the provisional process, to serving in full membership, newly ordained members must demonstrate that they can effectively use the skills they have developed throughout their formation. They must then continue to develop throughout their ministry careers. You may have all the skills you need. You may have received all the training that you possibly can. You may already have proven that you can do the job, yet you still need to take that final step with the help of a good support system. In the movie, The King's Speech, we meet Britain's Prince Albert. We learn that he has suffered from a sometimes debilitating speech impediment throughout his life, and we see him develop a relationship and friendship with his coach, speech coach, Lionel Logue, who has been hired to help the prince learn how to overcome stuttering. Born the second son of King George V, Prince Albert never imagined he would be king. But as events unfold and his brother, King Edward, abdicates the throne, Prince Albert is crowned King George VI of Great Britain and the Commonwealth. And he is, I'm sorry, I lost my place in the slide, so I'm sorry about that. Anyway, I told you, technology, it's always a challenge. Let me find my slide again, and then we'll go to that. Okay, so he's born King George V. He's the second, or he's born Prince Albert. He's the second son of King George V, and so he never really imagines that he will be the king. But as events unfold and his older brother, King Edward, abdicates the throne, Prince Albert is crowned King George VI of Great Britain and the Commonwealth, and this is obviously a very public position, and it demands very public speaking responsibilities. Throughout his speech lessons and with steady patience and training from Logue, the new king develops as a speaker, learns to manage stuttering, and comes to terms with his public speaking responsibilities. The film culminates as England enters the war against Nazi Germany in 1939. In the closing scene, we witness what is one of the most critical speeches of the 20th century, the king's radio address to the British Empire as war is declared. Now we're going to see two short scenes from the movie back to back. One is the speech begins, and then at the end, after the new king has finished the most important speech of his life. I love that scene because it reminds me that even after someone has come so far, they still must step out to become the leader God has called them to be. You can feel the tension in the room as that red light blinks and the British people wait in anticipation of the king's speech. As a mentor watching his student, you just agonize with Lionel, living through every moment of that speech, cheering, coaching, and giving confidence to the king. And it's fun at the end to rejoice. He stands in the background, the mentor who has helped equip the king with the skills he needs. One of the struggles that I've heard about from newly ordained clergy is a need for more support after the provisional process is complete. As provisional members, they participate in residency programs, clergy peer groups, meet with clergy mentors, and have regular contact with the Board of Ordained Ministry. 
During that time, they are part of an intricate web of support that assists and evaluates them as they become effective in ministry. But what happens after those candidates are ordained? The process is over, but a support system is still needed, especially in those early years of ministry. We're going to take the last few minutes of this session to talk with your board about how you provide continuing formation and support for clergy throughout ministry. How do you support newly ordained clergy as well as those who have been serving for a little while? What systems are in place through the orders of deacon and elder and the fellowship of local pastors and associate members to support clergy throughout ministry? And if you don't have an adequate support system, what are some steps that you can take to develop those systems? How does or how could your conference provide a way to ensure that those in their first five years of full membership continue to hone skills and learn the new ones that they'll need as they mature in their careers? And then how can you relate with your bishop and cabinet to ensure that, candidacy, that clergy have access to continuing education, coaching, counseling, or any other support that they may need. We'll take about you know, 10 minutes or so to talk about these. As we close this session, I'm gonna draw us back real quick. So we began this morning by thinking about our board's process and whether or not the process that we've developed is producing the outcomes needed for the identification, development, and support of effective clergy leaders. In short, is what we are doing getting us the leaders that we need? Throughout their journeys, the board assesses candidates on many different levels. We, have the, we often have the gift of rejoicing with those as they respond to God's call and serve gracefully and expertly in ministry. And sometimes there are more difficult decisions, sharing the news with a candidate that the district committee or the board has decided that she or he may not be called to license or ordain ministry in the United Methodist Church. All along the journey, however, we are called to be in a sacred place with candidates and with board members as we listen for God's voice and respond to God's leading and our discernment about giftedness, readiness, and effectiveness in ministry. God has called you to this work. I hope you will approach this work also as a ministry for your annual conference and for the candidates that you will meet. It is our privilege at the General Board of Higher Education and Ministry to partner with you throughout all of the phases of your board's work and ministry. And our staff looks forward to getting to know you during this event and talking with you about ways that we can work together to help support you in your annual conference. Thank you for being here and for your dedication to this ministry.